rapidly does this very sentiment now pale, how difficult nowadays is even the apprehension of this sentiment, how strangely does the language of Rousseau, Schiller, Shelley and Byron sound to our ear, in whom collectively the same fate of Europe was able to speak, which knew how to sing in Beethoven. Whatever German music came afterwards belongs to Romanticism, that is to say, to a movement which, historically considered, was still shorter, more fleeting, and more superficial than the great interlude, the transition of Europe from Rousseau to Napoleon, and to the rise of democracy. Weber, but what do we care nowadays of Freischitz and Oberon, or Marschner's Hans Heiling and Vampyre? or even Wagner's Tannhäuser. That is extinct, although not yet forgotten, music. This whole music of Romanticism, besides, was not noble enough, was not musical enough, to maintain its position anywhere but in the theatre and before the masses. From the beginning it was second-rate music, which was little thought of by genuine musicians. It was different with Felix Mendelssohn, that halcyon master, who, on account of his lighter, purer, happier soul, quickly acquired admiration and was equally quickly forgotten, as the beautiful episode of German music. But, with regard to Robert Schumann, who took things seriously, and has been taken seriously from the first, he was the last that founded a school. Do we not now regard it as a satisfaction, a relief, a deliverance, that this very romanticism of Schumann's has been surmounted? Schumann fleeing into the Saxon Switzerland of his soul, with a half werther like half Jean-Paul-like nature, assuredly not like Beethoven, assuredly not like Byron. His Manfred music is a mistake and a misunderstanding to the extent of injustice. Schumann, with his taste, which was fundamentally a petty taste, that is to say a dangerous propensity, doubly dangerous among Germans, for quiet lyricism and intoxication of the feelings. Going constantly apart, timidly withdrawing and retiring, a noble weakling who reveled in nothing but anonymous joy and sorrow, from the beginning a sort of girl and nulli metangere, this Schumann was already merely a German event in music, and no longer a European event, as Beethoven had been, as in a still greater degree Mozart had been. With Schumann, German music was threatened with its greatest danger, that of losing the voice for the soul of Europe, and sinking into a merely national affair. 246 what a torture are books written in German to a reader who has a third ear! How indignantly he stands beside the slowly turning swamp of sounds without tune and rhythms without dance, which Germans call a book! And even the German who reads books, how lazily, how reluctantly, how badly he reads! How many Germans know, and consider it obligatory to know, that there is art in every good sentence, art which must be divined if the sentence is to be understood. If there is a misunderstanding about its tempo, for instance, the sentence itself is misunderstood. That one must not be doubtful about the rhythm determining syllables, that one should feel the breaking of the too rigid symmetry as intentional and as a charm, that one should lend a fine and patient ear to every staccato and every rubato, that one should divine the sense and the sequence of the vowels and diphthongs, and how delicately and richly they can be tinted and retinted in the order of their arrangement. Who among book-reading Germans is complacent enough to recognize such duties and requirements, and to listen to so much art and intention in language? After all, one just has no ear for it and so the most marked contrasts of style are not heard, and the most delicate artistry, as it were, squandered on the deaf. These were my thoughts when I noticed how clumsily and unintuitively two masters in the art of prose-writing have been confounded, one whose words drop down hesitatingly and coldly, as from the roof of a damp cave. 
he counts on their dull sound and echo. And another, who manipulates his language like a flexible sword, and from his arm down to his toes, feels the dangerous bliss of the quivering, oversharp blade, which wishes to bite, hiss, and cut. 247. How little the German style has to do with harmony and with the ear is shown by the fact that precisely our good musicians themselves write badly. The German does not read aloud. He does not read for the ear, but only with his eyes. He has put his ears away in the drawer for the time. In antiquity, when a man read, which was seldom enough, he read something to himself and in a loud voice. They were surprised when any one read silently and sought secretly the reason of it. In a loud voice, that is to say, with all the swellings, inflections, and variations of key and changes of tempo in which the ancient public world took delight. The laws of the written style were then the same as those of the spoken style, and these laws depended partly on the surprising development and refined requirements of the ear and larynx, partly on the strength, endurance, and power of the ancient lungs. In the ancient sense, a period is above all a physiological whole, inasmuch as it is comprised in one breath. Such periods, as occur in Demosthenes and Cicero, swelling twice and sinking twice, and all in one breath, were pleasures to the men of antiquity, who knew by their own schooling how to appreciate the virtue therein, the rareness and the difficulty in the deliverance of such a period. We have really no right in the big period, we modern men, who are short of breath in every sense. These ancients, indeed, were all of them dilettanti in speaking, consequently connoisseurs, consequently critics. They thus brought their orators to the highest pitch, in the same manner as in the last century, when all Italian ladies and gentlemen knew how to sing. The virtuoso ship of song, and with it also the art of melody, reached its elevation. In Germany, however, until quite recently, when a kind of platform eloquence began shyly and awkwardly enough to flutter its young wings, there was, properly speaking, only one kind of public and approximately artistical discourse, that delivered from the pulpit. The preacher was the only one in Germany who knew the weight of a syllable or a word, in what manner a sentence strikes, springs, rushes, flows, and comes to a close. He alone had a conscience in his ears, often enough about conscience, for reasons are not lacking why proficiency in oratory should be especially seldom attained by a German, or almost always too late. The masterpiece of German prose is therefore with good reason the masterpiece of its greatest preacher. The Bible has hitherto been the best German book. Compared with Luther's Bible, almost everything else is merely literature, something which has not grown in Germany and therefore has not taken and does not take root in German hearts, as the Bible has done. 248. There are two kinds of geniuses, one which above all engenders and seeks to engender, and another which willingly lets itself be fructified and brings forth. And similarly, among the gifted nations, there are those on whom the woman's problem of pregnancy has devolved, and the secret task of forming, maturing, and perfecting. The Greeks, for instance, were a nation of this kind, and so are the French, and others which have to fructify and become the cause of new modes of life, like the Jews, the Romans, and in all modesty be it asked, like the Germans? Nations tortured and enraptured by unknown fevers, and irresistibly forced out of themselves, amorous and longing for foreign races, such as let themselves be fructified, and withal imperious, like everything conscious of being full of generative force, and consequently empowered by the grace of God. These two kinds of geniuses seek each other like man and woman, but they also misunderstand each other like man and woman. 
249. Every nation has its own tartufferie, and calls that its virtue. One does not know, cannot know, the best that is in one. 250. What Europe owes to the Jews? Many things, good and bad, and above all, one thing of the nature of both of the best and the worst, the grand style in morality, the fearfulness and majesty of infinite demands, of infinite significations, the whole romanticism and sublimity of moral questionableness. And consequently just the most attractive, ensnaring and exquisite element in those iridescences and allurements to life, in the aftersheen of which the sky of our European culture, its evening sky, now glows, perhaps glows out. For this we artists among the spectators and philosophers are grateful to the Jews. 251. It must be taken into the bargain, if various clouds and disturbances, in short slight attacks of stupidity, pass over the spirit of a people that suffers and wants to suffer from national nervous fever and political ambition. For instance, among present-day Germans there is alternately the anti-French folly, the anti-Semitic folly, the anti-Polish folly, the Christian romantic folly, the Wagnerian folly, the Teutonic folly, the Prussian folly, just look at all those poor historians, the Zubels and Treitschkes and their closely bandaged heads, and whatever else these little obscurations of the German spirit and conscience may be called. May it be forgiven me that I, too, when on a short daring sojourn into very infected ground, did not remain wholly exempt from the disease, but like everyone else, began to entertain thoughts about matters which did not concern me, the first symptom of political infection. About the Jews, for instance, listen to the following. I have never yet met a German who was favourably inclined to the Jews, and however decided the repudiation of actual anti-Semitism may be on the part of all prudent and political men. This prudence and policy is not perhaps directed against the nature of the sentiment itself, but only against its dangerous excess, and especially against the distasteful and infamous expression of this excess of sentiment. On this point we must not deceive ourselves. That Germany has amply sufficient Jews, that the German stomach, the German blood, has difficulty and will long have difficulty, in disposing only of this quantity of Jew, as the Italian, the Frenchman, and the Englishman have done by means of a stronger digestion. That is the unmistakable declaration and language of a general instinct, to which one must listen, and according to which one must act. Let no more Jews come in, and shut the doors, especially towards the east, also towards Austria. Thus commands the instinct of a people whose nature is still feeble and uncertain, so that it could be easily wiped out, easily extinguished, by a stronger race. The Jews, however, are beyond all doubt the strongest, toughest, and purest race at present living in Europe. They know how to succeed, even under the worst conditions. In fact, better than under favourable ones by means of virtues of some sort which one would like nowadays to label as vices, owing above all to a resolute faith which does not need to be ashamed before modern ideas. They alter only when they do alter, in the same way that the Russian Empire makes its conquest, as an empire that has plenty of time and is not of yesterday, namely, according to the principle, as slowly as possible. A thinker who has the future of Europe at heart will, in all his perspectives concerning the future, calculate upon the Jews, as he will calculate upon the Russians, as above all the surest and likeliest factors in the great play and battle of forces. That which is at present called a nation in Europe, and is really rather a race factor than a nata, 
perhaps sometimes confusingly similar to a res ficta et picta, is in every case something evolving, young, easily displaced, and not yet a race, much less such a race ere perennis, as the Jews are such nations, should most carefully avoid all hot-headed rivalry and hostility. It is certain that the Jews, if they desired, or if they were driven to it, as the anti-Semites seemed to wish, could have the ascendancy, nay, literally the supremacy, over Europe, that they are not working and planning for that end is equally certain. Meanwhile, they rather wish and desire, even somewhat importunely, to be insorbed and absorbed by Europe. They long to be finally settled, authorized and respected somewhere, and wish to put an end to the nomadic life, to the wandering Jew, and one should certainly take account of this impulse and tendency and make advances to it. It possibly betokens a mitigation of the Jewish instincts, for which purpose it would perhaps be useful and fair to banish the anti-Semitic ballers out of the country. One should make advances, with all prudence and with selection, pretty much as the English nobility do. It stands to reason that the most powerful and strongly marked types of new Germanism could enter into relation with the Jews with the least hesitation. For instance, the nobleman officer from the Prussian border it would be interesting in many ways to see whether the genius for money and patience, and especially some intellect and intellectuality, sadly lacking in the place referred to, could not in addition be annexed and trained to the hereditary art of commanding and obeying. For both of which the country in question has now a classic reputation. But here it is expedient to break off my festal discourse at my sprightly Teutonomania, for I have already reached my serious topic, the European problem, as I understand it, the rearing of a new ruling caste for Europe. 252. They are not a philosophical race, the English. Bacon represents an attack on the philosophical spirit generally. Hobbes, Hume and Locke an abasement, and a depreciation of the idea of a philosopher for more than a century. It was against Hume that Kant uprose and raised himself. It was Locke, of whom Schelling rightly said, Je me prise Locke. In the struggle against the English mechanical stultification of the world, Hegel and Schopenhauer, along with Goethe, were of one accord. The two hostile brother geniuses in philosophy who pushed in different directions towards the opposite poles of German thought, and thereby wronged each other as only brothers will do. What is lacking in England, and has always been lacking, that half-actor and rhetorician knew well enough, the absurd muddlehead Carlyle, who sought to conceal under passionate grimaces what he knew about himself, namely what was lacking in Carlyle, real power of intellect, real depths of intellectual perception, in short, philosophy. It is characteristic of such an unphilosophical race to hold on firmly to Christianity. They need its discipline for moralizing and humanizing. The Englishman, more gloomy, sensual, headstrong and brutal than the German, is for that very reason, as the baser of the two, also the most pious, he has all the more need of Christianity. To find the nostrils, this English Christianity itself has still a characteristic English taint of spleen and alcoholic excess, for which, owing to good reasons, it is used as an antidote. The finer poison to neutralize the coarser, a finer form of poisoning, is in fact a step in advance with coarse-mannered people, a step towards spiritualization. The English coarseness and rustic demureness is still most satisfactorily disguised by Christian pantomime and by praying and psalm singing, or, more correctly, it is thereby explained and differently expressed. And for the herd of drunkards and rakes, 
who formerly learned moral grunting under the influence of Methodism, and more recently as the Salvation Army. A penitential fit may really be the relatively highest manifestation of humanity to which they can be elevated. So much may reasonably be admitted. That, however, which offends even in the humanist Englishman is his lack of music, to speak figuratively, and also literally. He has neither rhythm nor dance in the movements of his soul and body. Indeed, not even the desire for rhythm and dance, for music. Listen to him speaking. Look at the most beautiful Englishwoman walking. In no country on earth are there more beautiful doves and swans. Finally, listen to them singing. But I ask too much. 253. There are truths which are best recognized by mediocre minds, because they are best adapted for them. There are truths which only possess charms and seductive power for mediocre spirits. One is pushed to this probably unpleasant conclusion, now that the influence of respectable but mediocre Englishmen, I may mention Darwin, John Stuart Mill and Herbert Spencer, begins to gain the ascendancy of the middle-class region of European taste. Indeed, who could doubt that it is a useful thing for such minds to have the ascendancy for a time? It would be an error to consider the highly developed and independently soaring minds as specially qualified for determining and collecting many little common facts and deducing conclusions from them. As exceptions, they are rather from the first in no very favourable position towards those who are the rules. After all, they have more to do than merely to perceive. In effect, they have to be something new. They have to signify something new. They have to represent new values. The gulf between knowledge and capacity is perhaps greater and also more mysterious than one thinks. The capable man in the grand style the creator, will possibly have to be an ignorant person, while on the other hand, for scientific discoveries like those of Darwin, a certain narrowness, aridity, and industrious carefulness, in short, something English, may not be unfavourable for arriving at them. Finally, let it not be forgotten that the English, with their profound mediocrity, brought about once before a general depression of European intelligence. What is called modern ideas, or the ideas of the 18th century, or French ideas, that, consequently, against which the German mind rose up with profound disgust, is of English origin, there is no doubt about it. The French were only the apes and actors of these ideas, their best soldiers, and likewise, alas, their first and profoundest victims. For owing to the diabolical anglomania of modern ideas, the arme francais has in the end become so thin and emaciated that at present one recalls its sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, its profound, passionate strength, its inventive excellency almost with disbelief. One must, however, maintain this verdict of historical justice in a determined manner, and defend against it present prejudices and appearances. The European noblesse, of sentiment, taste and manners, taking the word in every high sense, is the work and invention of France. The European ignobleness, the plebeianism of modern ideas, is England's work and invention. 254. Even at present, France is still the seat of the most intellectual and refined culture of Europe. It is still the high school of taste. But one must know how to find this France of taste. He who belongs to it keeps himself well concealed. There may be a small number in whom it lives and is embodied. Besides, perhaps, being men who do not stand upon the strongest legs, in part fatalists, hypochondriacs, invalids, in part persons overindulged, overrefined, such as have the ambition to conceal themselves. 
They have all something in common. They keep their ears closed in presence of the delirious folly and noisy spouting of the democratic bourgeois. In fact, a besotted and brutalized France at present sprawls in the foreground. It recently celebrated a veritable orgy of bad taste, and at the same time of self-admiration, in the funeral of Victor Hugo. There is also something else common to them, a predilection to resist intellectual Germanizing, and a still greater inability to do so. In this France of intellect, which is also a France of pessimism, Schopenhauer has become more at home, and more indigenous than he has ever been in Germany, not to speak of Heinrich Heine, who has long ago been reincarnated in the more refined and fastidious lyricists of Paris, or of Hegel, who at present, in the form of Ten, the first of living historians, exercises an almost tyrannical influence. As regards Richard Wagner, however, the more French music learns to adapt itself to the actual needs of the âme moderne, the more will it Wagner ride. One can safely predict that beforehand. It is already taking place sufficiently. There are, however, three things which the French can still boast of with pride as their heritage and possession, and as indelible tokens of their ancient intellectual superiority in Europe. In spite of all voluntary or involuntary Germanizing and vulgarizing of taste. Firstly, the capacity for artistic emotion, for devotion to form, for which the expression l'art pour l'art, along with numerous others, has been invented. Such capacity has not been lacking in France for three centuries, and owing to its reverence for the small number, it has again and again made a sort of chamber music of literature possible, which is sought for in vain elsewhere in Europe. The second thing whereby the French can lay claim to a superiority over Europe is their ancient many-sided moralistic culture, owing to which one finds on an average, even in the petty romanciers of the newspapers and chance boulevardier de Paris, a psychological sensitiveness and curiosity, of which, for example, one has no conception, to say nothing of the thing itself, in Germany. The Germans lack a couple of centuries of the moralistic work requisite thereto, which, as we have said, France has not grudged. Those who call the Germans naive on that account give them commendation for a defect. As the opposite of the German inexperience, and innocence in voluptate psychologica, which is not too remotely associated with the tediousness of German intercourse, and as the most successful expression of genuine French curiosity and inventive talent in this domain of delicate thrills, Henri Bell may be noted, that remarkably anticipatory and forerunning man, who, with a Napoleonic tempo, traversed his Europe in fact, several centuries of the European soul, as a surveyor and discoverer thereof. It has required two generations to overtake him one way or other, to divine long afterwards some of the riddles that perplexed and enraptured him, this strange Epicurean and man of interrogation, the last great psychologist of France. There is yet a third claim to superiority. In the French character there is a successful halfway synthesis of the North and South, which makes them comprehend many things and enjoins upon them other things, which an Englishman can never comprehend. Their temperament turned alternately to and from the South, in which from time to time the Provençal and Ligurian blood froths over, preserves them from the dreadful Northern grey and grey from sunless conceptual spectrism, and from poverty of blood, our German infirmity of taste, for the excessive prevalence of which, at the present moment, blood and iron, that is to say, high politics, has with great resolution been prescribed, according to a dangerous healing art which bids me wait and wait, but not yet hope. There is still in France a pre-understanding 
and ready welcome for those rarer and rarely gratified men, who are too comprehensive to find satisfaction of any kind to fatherlandism, and know how to love the South when in the North, and the North when in the South, the born Midlanders, the good Europeans. For them Bizet has made music, this latest genius who has seen a new beauty and seduction, who has discovered a piece of the South in music. 255. I hold that many precautions should be taken against German music. Suppose a person loves the South as I love it, as a great school of recovery for the most spiritual and the most sensuous ills, as a boundless solar profusion and effulgence which overspreads a sovereign existence believing in itself. Well, such a person will learn to be somewhat on his guard against German music, because in injuring his taste anew, it will also injure his health anew. Such a southerner, a southerner not by origin, but by belief, if he should dream of the future of music, must also dream of it being freed from the influence of a north, and must have in his ears the prelude to a deeper, mightier, and perhaps more perverse and mysterious music, a super-German music, which does not fade, pale, and die away, as all German music does, at the sight of the blue wanton sea and the Mediterranean clearness of sky, a super-European music, which holds its own even in presence of the brown sunsets of the desert, whose soul is akin to the palm tree, and can be at home and can roam with big, beautiful, lonely beasts of prey. I could imagine a music of which the rarest charm would be that it knew nothing more of good and evil, only that here and there perhaps some sailor's homesickness, some golden shadows and tender weaknesses, might sweep lightly over it, an art which, from the far distance, would see the colours of a sinking and almost incomprehensible moral world, fleeing towards it, and would be hospitable enough and profound enough to receive such belated fugitives. 256. Owing to the morbid estrangement which the nationality craze has induced, and still induces, among the nations of Europe, owing also to the short-sighted and hasty-handed politicians, who, with the help of this craze, are at present in power, and do not suspect to what extent the disintegrating policy they pursue must necessarily be only an interlude policy. Owing to all this, and much else that is altogether unmentionable at present, the most unmistakable signs that Europe wishes to be one are now overlooked or arbitrarily and falsely misinterpreted. With all the more profound and large-minded men of this century, the real general tendency of the mysterious labour of their souls was to prepare the way for that new synthesis and tentatively to anticipate the European of the future. Only in their simulations, or in their weaker moments, in old age perhaps, did they belong to the fatherlands. They only rested from themselves when they became patriots. I think of such men as Napoleon, Goethe, Beethoven, Stendhal, Heinrich Heine, Schopenhauer. It must not be taken amiss if I also count Richard Wagner among them, about whom one must not let oneself be deceived by his own misunderstandings. Geniuses like him have seldom the right to understand themselves. Still less, of course, by the unseemly noise with which he is now resisted and opposed in France. The fact remains, nevertheless, that Richard Wagner and the later French Romanticism of the forties are most closely and intimately related to one another. They are akin, fundamentally akin, in all the heights and depths of their requirements. It is Europe, the one Europe, whose soul presses urgently and longingly, outwards and upwards, in their multifarious and boisterous art, Whither? Into a new light? Towards a new sun? 
but who would attempt to express accurately what all these masters of new modes of speech could not express distinctly? It is certain that the same storm and stress tormented them, that they sought in the same manner these last great seekers. All of them steeped in literature to their eyes and ears, the first artists of universal literary culture, for the most part, even themselves writers, poets, intermediaries, and blenders of the art and the senses. Wagner as musician is reckoned among painters, as poet among musicians, as artist generally among actors. All of them fanatics for expression at any cost. I especially mention Delacroix, the nearest related to Wagner, all of them great discoverers of the realm of the sublime, also of the loathsome and dreadful, yet greater discoverers in effect, in display, in the art of the show-shop, all of them talented far beyond their genius, out and out virtuosi, with mysterious accesses to all that seduces, allures, constrains and upsets, born enemies of logic and the straight line, hankering after the strange, the exotic, the monstrous, the crooked, and the self-contradictory, as men, tantaluses of the will, plebeian parvenu, who knew themselves to be incapable of a noble tempo, or of a lento, in life and action. Think of Balzac, for instance, unrestrained workers, almost destroying themselves by work, antinomians and rebels in manners, ambitious and insatiable, without equilibrium and enjoyment, all of them finally shattering and sinking down at the Christian cross, and with right and reason, for who of them would have been sufficiently profound and sufficiently original for an anti-Christian philosophy? On the whole, a boldly daring, splendidly overbearing, high-flying and aloft-up-dragging class of higher men who had first to teach their century, and it is the century of the masses, the conception higher man. Let the German friends of Richard Wagner advise together as to whether there is anything purely German in the Wagnerian art, whether its distinction does not consist precisely in coming from super-German sources and impulses, in which connection it may not be underrated how indispensable Paris was in the development of his type, which the strength of his instincts made him long to visit at the most decisive time, and how the whole style of his proceedings, of his self-apostolate, could only perfect itself in sight of the French socialistic original. On a more subtle comparison, it will perhaps be found, to the honour of Richard Wagner's German nature, that he has acted in everything with more strength, daring, severity and elevation than a nineteenth-century Frenchman could have done. Owing to the circumstance that we Germans are as yet nearer to barbarism than the French, Perhaps even the most remarkable creation of Richard Wagner is not only at present, but forever inaccessible, incomprehensible, and inimitable to the whole latter-day Latin race. The figure of Siegfried, that very free man, who was probably far too free, too hard, too cheerful, too healthy, too anti-Catholic for the taste of old and mellow civilized nations. He may even have been a sin against Romanticism, this anti-Latin Siegfried. Well, Wagner atoned amply for this sin in his old sad days, when, anticipating a taste which has meanwhile passed into politics, he began, with a religious vehemence peculiar to him, to preach, at least, the way to Rome, if not walk therein. That these last words may not be misunderstood, I will call to my aid a few powerful rhymes, which will even betray to less delicate ears what I mean. What I mean counter to the last Wagner and his Parsifal music. Is this our mode? From German heart came this vexed ululating? 
from German body this self-lacerating? Is ours this priestly hand dilation, this incense-fuming exaltation? Is ours this faltering, falling, shambling, this quite uncertain ding-dong dangling? This sly nun ogling, our our bell ringing, this holy false enraptured heaven o'erspringing? Is this our mode? Think well. Ye still wait for admission, for what ye hear is Rome, Rome's faith by intuition. End of chapter 8 Peoples and Countries Recorded by Gesine in Valletta, January 2006 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Recording by LibriVox user President Leith, P-R-E-S-L-E-T-H-E. -E. Beyond Good and Evil by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Helen Zimmern. Chapter 9. What is Noble? Paragraph 257. Every elevation of the type man has hitherto been the work of an aristocratic society, and so it will always be, a society believing in a long scale of gradations of rank and differences of worth among human beings, and requiring slavery in some form or other. Without the pathos of distance, such as grows out of the incarnated differences of classes, out of the constant outlooking and downlooking of the ruling caste on subordinates and instruments, and out of their equally constant practice of obeying and commanding, of keeping down and keeping at a distance, that other more mysterious pathos could never have arisen, the longing for an ever-new widening of distance within the soul itself, the formation of ever higher, rarer, further, more extended, more comprehensive states, in short, just the elevation of the type man, the continued self-surmounting of man, to use a moral formula in a supermoral sense. To be sure, one must not resign oneself to any humanitarian illusions about the history of the origin of an aristocratic society, that is to say, of the preliminary condition for the elevation of the type man. The truth is hard. Let us acknowledge unprejudicedly how every higher civilization hitherto has originated. Men with a still natural nature, barbarians in every terrible sense of the word, men of prey, still in possession of unbroken strength of will and desire for power, threw themselves upon weaker, more moral, more peaceful races, perhaps trading or cattle-rearing communities, or upon old, mellow civilizations in which the final vital force was flickering out in brilliant fireworks of wit and depravity. At the commencement, the noble caste was always the barbarian caste. Their superiority did not consist, first of all, in their physical, but in their psychical power. They were more complete men, which at every point also implies the same as more complete beasts. Corruption, as the indication that anarchy threatens to break out among the instincts and that the foundation of the emotions, called life, is convulsed, is something radically different according to the organization in which it manifests itself. When, for instance, an aristocracy like that of France at the beginning of the Revolution flung away its privileges with sublime disgust and sacrificed itself to an excess of its moral sentiments, it was corruption. It was really only the closing act of the corruption that had existed for centuries, by virtue of which that aristocracy had abdicated step by step its lordly prerogatives and lowered itself to a function of royalty, in the end even to its decoration and parade dress. The essential thing, however, in a good and healthy aristocracy is that it should not regard itself as a function either of the kingship or the commonwealth, but as the significance and highest justification thereof, that it should therefore accept with a good conscience the sacrifice of a legion of individuals who for its sake must be suppressed and reduced to imperfect men, to slaves and instruments. 
Its fundamental belief must be precisely that society is not allowed to exist for its own sake, but only as a foundation and scaffolding, by means of which a select class of beings may be able to elevate themselves to their higher duties, and, in general, to a higher existence. Like those sun-seeking climbing plants in Java, they are called Sipo Matador, which encircle an oak so long and so often with their arms until at last high above it but supported by it, they can unfold their tops in the open light and exhibit their happiness. To refrain mutually from injury, from violence, from exploitation, and put one's will on a par with that of others, this may result in a certain rough sense in good conduct among individuals when the necessary conditions are given, namely the actual similarity of the individuals in amount of force and degree of worth and their correlation within one organization. As soon, however, as one wished to take this principle more generally, and, if possible, even as the fundamental principle of society, it would immediately disclose what it really is, namely a will to the denial of life, a principle of dissolution and decay. Here one must think profoundly to the very basis and resist all sentimental weakness. Life itself is essentially appropriation, injury, conquest of the strange and weak, suppression, severity, obtrusion of peculiar forms, incorporation, and, at the very least, putting it mildest, exploitation. But why should one forever use precisely these words on which for ages a disparaging purpose has been stamped? Even the organization within which, as was previously supposed, the individuals treat each other as equal, it takes place in every healthy aristocracy, must itself, if it be a living and not a dying organization, do all that towards other bodies that the individuals within it refrain from doing to each other, it will have to be the incarnated will to power. It will endeavor to grow, to gain ground, attract to itself, and acquire ascendancy, not owing to any morality or immorality, but because it lives, and because life is precisely will to power. On no point, however, is the ordinary consciousness of Europeans more unwilling to be corrected than on this matter. People now rave everywhere, even under the guise of science, about coming conditions of society in which the exploiting character is to be absent. That sounds to my ears as if they promised to invent a mode of life that should refrain from all organic functions. Exploitation does not belong to a depraved or imperfect and primitive society. It belongs to the nature of the living being as a primary organic function. It is a consequence of the intrinsic will to power, which is precisely the will to life. Granting that as a theory this is a novelty, as a reality it is the fundamental fact of all history. Let us be so far honest towards ourselves." In a tour through the many finer and coarser moralities that have hitherto prevailed or still prevail on the earth, I found certain traits recurring regularly together, and connected with one another until finally two primary types revealed themselves to me, and a radical distinction was brought to light. There is master morality and slave morality. I would at once add, however, that in all higher and mixed civilizations there are also attempts at the reconciliation of the two moralities, but one finds still oftener the confusion and mutual misunderstanding of them, indeed sometimes their close juxtaposition, even in the same man, within one soul. The distinctions of moral values have either originated in a ruling caste, pleasantly conscious of being different from the ruled, or among the ruled class, the slaves and dependents of all sorts. In the first case, when it is the rulers who determine the conception good, it is the exalted, proud disposition that is regarded as the distinguishing feature, and that that determines the order of rank. The noble type of man separates from himself the beings in whom the opposite of this exalted, proud disposition displays itself. He despises them. Let it at once be noted that in this first kind of morality the antithesis good and bad means practically the same as noble and despicable. The antithesis good and evil is of a different origin. 
The cowardly, the timid, the insignificant, and those thinking merely of narrow utility are despised. Moreover, also the distrustful, with their constrained glances, the self-abasing, the dog-like kind of men who let themselves be abused, the mendicant flatterers, and above all the liars. It is a fundamental belief of all aristocrats that the common people are untruthful. We truthful ones, the nobility in ancient Greece called themselves, it is obvious that everywhere the designations of moral value were at first applied to men, and were only derivatively and at a later period applied to actions. It is a gross mistake, therefore, when historians of morals start with questions like, why have sympathetic actions been praised? The noble type of man regards himself as a determiner of values. He does not require to be approved of. He passes the judgment. What is injurious to me is injurious in itself. He knows that it is he himself only who confers honor on things. He is a creator of values. He honors whatever he recognizes in himself. Such morality equals self-glorification. In the foreground there is the feeling of plenitude, of power which seeks to overflow, the happiness of high tension, the consciousness of a wealth that would fain give and bestow. The noble man also helps the unfortunate, but not, or scarcely, out of pity, but rather from an impulse generated by the superabundance of power. The noble man honors in himself the powerful one, him also who has power over himself, who knows how to speak and how to keep silence, who takes pleasure in subjecting himself to severity and hardness, and has reverence for all that is severe and hard. Wotan placed a hard heart in my breast, says an old Scandinavian saga. It is thus rightly expressed from the soul of a proud Viking. Such a type of man is even proud of not being made for sympathy. The hero of the saga therefore adds warningly, He who has not a hard heart when young will never have one. The noble and brave who think thus are the furthest removed from the morality that sees precisely in sympathy or in acting for the good of others or in désintéressement the characteristic of the moral. Faith in oneself, pride in oneself, a radical enmity and irony towards selflessness belong as definitely to noble morality as do a careless scorn and precaution in presence of sympathy and the warm heart. It is the powerful who know how to honor. It is their art, their domain for invention. The profound reverence for age and for tradition, all law rests on this double reverence, the belief and prejudice in favor of ancestors and unfavorable to newcomers, is typical in the morality of the powerful. And, if, reversely, men of modern ideas believe almost instinctively in progress and the future, and are more and more lacking in respect for old age, the ignoble origin of these ideas has complacently betrayed itself thereby. A morality of the ruling class, however, is more specifically foreign and irritating to present-day taste in the sternness of its principle that one has duties only to one's equals, that one may act towards beings of a lower rank, towards all that is foreign, just as seems good to one or as the heart desires, and in any case beyond good and evil. It is here that sympathy and similar sentiments can have a place. The ability and obligation to exercise prolonged gratitude and prolonged revenge, both only within the circle of equals, artfulness in retaliation, raffinement, the idea in friendship, a certain necessity to have enemies as outlets for the emotions of envy, quarrelsomeness, arrogance, in fact, in order to be a good friend, all these are typical characteristics of the noble morality which, as has been pointed out, is not the morality of modern ideas, and is therefore at present difficult to realize, and also to unearth and disclose. It is otherwise with the second type of morality, slave morality. Supposing that the abused, the oppressed, the suffering, the unemancipated, the weary, and those uncertain of themselves should moralize, what will be the common element in their moral estimates? Probably a pessimistic suspicion with regard to the entire situation of man will find expression, perhaps a condemnation of man, together with his situation. The slave has an unfavorable eye for the virtues of the powerful. He has a skepticism and distrust, a refinement of distrust of everything good that is there honored. 
he would fain persuade himself that the very happiness there is not genuine. On the other hand, those qualities that serve to alleviate the existence of sufferers are brought into prominence and flooded with light. It is here that sympathy, the kind helping hand, the warm heart, patience, diligence, humility, and friendliness attain to honor. For here these are the most useful qualities, and almost the only means of supporting the burden of existence. Slave morality is essentially the morality of utility. Here is the seat of the origin of the famous antithesis good and evil. Power and dangerousness are assumed to reside in the evil, a certain dreadfulness, subtlety, and strength which do not admit of being despised. According to slave morality, therefore, the evil man arouses fear. According to master morality, it is precisely the good man who arouses fear and seeks to arouse it, while the bad man is regarded as the despicable being. The contrast attains its maximum when, in accordance with the logical consequences of slave morality, a shade of depreciation, it may be slight and well-intentioned, at last attaches itself to the good man of this morality, because, according to the servile mode of thought, the good man must in any case be the safe man. He is good-natured, easily deceived, perhaps a little stupid, un bonhomme. Everywhere that slave morality gains the ascendancy, language shows a tendency to approximate the significations of the word good and stupid. A last fundamental difference, the desire for freedom, the instinct for happiness and the refinements of the feeling of liberty, belong as necessarily to slave morals and morality as artifice and enthusiasm in reverence and devotion are the regular symptoms of an aristocratic mode of thinking and estimating. Hence we can understand, without further detail, why love, as a passion, it is our European specialty, must absolutely be a noble origin. As is well known, its invention is due to the Provençal poet cavaliers, those brilliant, ingenious men of the Gaisabelle, to whom Europe owes so much, and almost owes itself. Vanity is one of the things that are perhaps most difficult for a noble man to understand. He will be tempted to deny it where another kind of man thinks he sees it self-evidently. The problem for him is to represent to his mind beings who seek to arouse a good opinion of themselves that they themselves do not possess, and consequently also do not deserve, and who yet believe in this good opinion afterwards. This seems to him, on the one hand, such bad taste and so self-disrespectful, and, on the other hand, so grotesquely unreasonable, that he would like to consider vanity an exception and is doubtful about it in most cases when it is spoken of. He will say, for instance, I may be mistaken about my value, and, on the other hand, may nevertheless demand that my value should be acknowledged by others precisely as I rate it. That, however, is not vanity, but self-conceit, or in most cases that which is called humility and also modesty. Or he will even say, for many reasons I can delight in the good opinion of others, perhaps because I love and honor them, and rejoice in all their joys, perhaps also because their good opinion endorses and strengthens my belief in my own good opinion, perhaps because the good opinion of others, even in cases where I do not share it, is useful to me, or gives promise of usefulness. All this, however, is not vanity. The man of noble character must first bring it home forcibly to his mind, especially with the aid of history, that from time immemorial, in all social strata in any way dependent, the ordinary man was only that that he passed for. Not being at all accustomed to fix values, he did not assign even to himself any other value than that that his master assigned to him. It is the peculiar right of masters to create values. It may be looked upon as an extraordinary atavism that the ordinary man, even at present, is still always waiting for an opinion about himself, and then instinctively submitting himself to it, yet by no means only to a good opinion, but also to a bad and unjust one. Think, for instance, of the greater part of the self-appreciations and self-depreciations that believing women learn from their confessors, and which in general the believing Christian learns from his church. In fact, 
conformably to the slow rise of the democratic social order and its cause, the blending of the blood of masters and slaves, the original noble and rare impulse of the masters to assign a value to themselves and to think well of themselves will now be more and more encouraged and extended, but it has at all times an older, ampler, and more radically ingrained propensity opposed to it, and in the phenomenon of vanity this older propensity overmasters the younger. The vain person rejoices over every good opinion that he hears about himself, quite apart from the point of view of its usefulness and equally regardless of its truth or falsehood, just as he suffers from every bad opinion. For he subjects himself to both, he feels himself subjected to both by the oldest instinct of subjection that breaks forth in him. It is the slave in the vain man's blood, the remains of the slave's craftiness, and how much of the slave is still left in woman, for instance, which seeks to seduce the good opinions of itself. It is the slave, too, who immediately afterwards falls prostrate himself before these opinions as though he had not called them forth. And, to repeat it again, vanity is an atavism. A species originates, and a type becomes established and strong in the long struggle with essentially constant unfavorable conditions. On the other hand, it is known by the experience of breeders that species that receive superabundant nourishment, and in general a surplus of protection and care, immediately tend in the most marked way to develop variations, and are fertile in prodigies and monstrosities, also in monstrous vices. Now look at an aristocratic commonwealth, say an ancient Greek polis, or Venice, as a voluntary or involuntary contrivance for the purpose of rearing human beings. There are there men beside one another, thrown upon their own resources, who want to make their species prevail, chiefly because they must prevail, or else run the terrible danger of being exterminated. The favor, the superabundance, the protection are there lacking under which variations are fostered. The species needs itself as species, as something that precisely by virtue of its hardness, its uniformity and simplicity of structure, can in general prevail and make itself permanent in constant struggle with its neighbors, or with rebellious or rebellion-threatening vassals. The most varied experience teaches it what are the qualities to which it principally owes the fact that it still exists, in spite of all gods and men, and has hitherto been victorious. These qualities it calls virtues, and these virtues alone it develops to maturity. It does so with severity, indeed it desires severity. Every aristocratic morality is intolerant in the education of youth, in the control of women, in the marriage customs, in the relations of old and young, in the penal laws, which have an eye only for the degenerating. It counts intolerance itself among the virtues under the name of justice, a type with few but very marked features, a species of severe, warlike, wisely silent, reserved, and reticent men, and as such with the most delicate sensibility for the charm and nuances of society, is thus established, unaffected by the vicissitudes of generations. The constant struggle with uniform, unfavorable conditions is, as already remarked, the cause of a type's becoming stable and hard. Finally, however, a happy state of things results. The enormous tension is relaxed. There are perhaps no more enemies among the neighboring peoples, and the means of life, even of the enjoyment of life, are present in superabundance. With one stroke, the bond and constraint of the old discipline severs. It is no longer regarded as necessary, as a condition of existence. If it would continue, it can only do so as a form of luxury, as an archaizing taste. Variations, whether they be deviations into the higher, finer, and rarer, or deteriorations and monstrosities, appear suddenly on the scene in the greatest exuberance and splendor. The individual dares to be individual and detach himself. At this turning point of history there manifest themselves, side by side and often mixed and entangled together, a magnificent, manifold, virgin forest-like upgrowth and upstriving, a kind of tropical tempo in the rivalry of growth, and an extraordinary decay and self-destruction owing to the savagely opposing and seemingly exploding egoisms which strive with one another for sun and light, and can no longer assign any limit, restraint, or forbearance for themselves by means 
remains of the hitherto existing morality. It is this morality itself that piled up the strength so enormously, which bent the bow in so threatening a manner. It is now out of date. It is getting out of date. The dangerous and disquieting point has been reached when the greater, more manifold, more comprehensive life is lived beyond the old morality. The individual stands out and is obliged to have recourse to his own law-giving, his own arts and artifices for self-preservation, self-elevation, and self-deliverance. Nothing but new whys, nothing but new hows, no common formulas any longer, misunderstanding and disregard in league with each other, decay, deterioration, and the loftiest desires frightfully entangled, the genius of the race overflowing from all the cornucopias of good and bad, a portentous simultaneousness of spring and autumn, full of new charms and mysteries peculiar to the fresh, still exhausted, still unwearied corruption." Danger is again present, the mother of morality, great danger, this time shifted into the individual, into the neighbor and friend, into the street, into their own child, into their own heart, into all the most personal and secret recesses of their desires and volitions. What will the moral philosophers who appear at this time have to preach? They discover, these sharp onlookers and loafers, that the end is quickly approaching, that everything around them decays and produces decay, that nothing will endure until the day after tomorrow, except one species of man, the incurably mediocre. The mediocre alone have a prospect of continuing and propagating themselves. They will be the men of the future, the sole survivors. Be like them, become mediocre, is now the only morality that has still a significance, which still obtains a hearing. But it is difficult to preach this morality of mediocrity. It can never avow what it is and what it desires. It has to talk of moderation and dignity and duty and brotherly love. It will have difficulty in concealing its irony. There is an instinct for rank, which, more than anything else, is already the sign of a high rank, there is a delight in the nuances of reverence that leads one to infer noble origin and habits. The refinement, goodness, and loftiness of a soul are put to a perilous test when something passes by that is of the highest rank, but is not yet protected by the awe of the authority from obtrusive touches and incivilities. Something that goes its way like a living touchstone, undistinguished, undiscovered, and tentative, perhaps voluntarily veiled and disguised. He whose task and practice is to investigate souls will avail himself of many varieties of this very art to determine the, the ultimate value of a soul, the unalterable innate order of rank to which it belongs. He will test it by its instinct for reverence. Differences engender N. That's French hate there. The vulgarity of many a nature spurts up suddenly like dirty water, when any holy vessel, any jewel from closed shrines, any book bearing the marks of great destiny is brought before it. While, on the other hand, there is an involuntary silence, a hesitation of the eye, a cessation of all gestures, by which it is indicated that a soul feels the nearness of what is worthiest of respect, the way in which, on the whole, the reverence for the Bible has hitherto been maintained in Europe is perhaps the best example of discipline and refinement of manners that Europe owes to Christianity. Books of such profoundness and supreme significance require for their protection an external tyranny of authority in order to acquire the period of thousands of years that is necessary to exhaust and unriddle them. Much has been achieved when the sentiment has been at last instilled into the masses, the shallow pates and the boobies of every kind, that they are not allowed to touch everything, that there are holy experiences before which they must take off their shoes and keep away the unclean hand. It is almost their highest advance towards humanity. On the contrary, in the so-called cultured classes, the believers in modern ideas, nothing is perhaps so repulsive as their lack of shame, their easy insolence of eye and hand with which they touch, taste, and finger everything. And it is possible that even yet there is more relative nobility of taste and more tact for reverence among the people, among the lower classes of the people, especially among peasants, than among the newspaper-reading demimonde of intellect the cultured class. 
It cannot be effaced from a man's soul what his ancestors have preferably and most constantly done. Whether they were perhaps diligent economizers attached to a desk and a cash box, modest and citizen-like in their desires, modest also in their virtues, or whether they were accustomed to commanding from morning till night, fond of rude pleasures and probably of still ruder duties and responsibilities, or whether, finally, at one time or another, they have sacrificed old privileges of birth and possession in order to live wholly for their faith, for their God, as men of an inexorable and sensitive conscience which blushes at every compromise. It is quite possible for a man not to have the qualities and predilections of his parents and ancestors in his constitution, whatever appearances may suggest to the contrary. This is the problem of race, granted that one knows something of the parents, it is admissible to draw a conclusion about the child, any kind of offensive incontinence, any kind of sordid envy, or of clumsy self-vaunting, the three things that together have constituted the genuine plebeian type in all times, such must pass over to the child as surely as bad blood. And with the help of the best education and culture, one will only succeed in deceiving with regard to such heredity. And what else do education and culture try to do nowadays? In our very democratic, or rather very plebeian age, education and culture must be essentially the art of deceiving, deceiving with regard to origin, with regard to the inherited plebeianism in body and soul. An educator who nowadays preaches truthfulness above everything else, and called out constantly to his pupils, Be true, be natural, show yourselves as you are, even such a virtuous and sincere ass would learn in a short time to have recourse to the furca of Horace, naturum expellere. With what results? Plebeianism. Usque recurret. Footnote. Horace's Epistles. 1, 10, 24. At the risk of displeasing innocent ears, I submit that egoism belongs to the essence of a noble soul. I mean the unalterable belief that to a being such as we, other beings must naturally be in subjection and have to sacrifice themselves. The noble soul accepts the fact of his egoism without question, and also without consciousness of harshness, constraint, or arbitrariness therein, but rather is something that may have its basis in the primary law of things. If he sought a designation for it, he would say, It is justice itself. He acknowledges, under certain circumstances, which made him hesitate at first, that there are other equally privileged ones. As soon as he has settled this question of rank, he moves among those equals and equally privileged ones with the same assurance as regards modesty and delicate respect that he enjoys in intercourse with himself, in accordance with an innate heavenly mechanism that all the stars understand. It is an additional instance of his egoism, this artfulness and self-limitation in intercourse with his equals. Every star is a similar egoist. He honors himself in them, and in the right that he concedes to them, he has no doubt that the exchange of honors and rights as the essence of all intercourse belongs also to the natural condition of things. The noble soul gives as he takes, prompted by the passionate and sensitive instinct of requital, which is at the root of his nature. The notion of favor has, inter pares, neither significance nor good repute. There may be a sublime way of letting gifts, as it were, light upon one from above, and of drinking them thirstily like dewdrops. But for those arts and displays the noble soul has no aptitude. His egoism hinders him here. In general he looks aloft unwillingly. He looks either forward horizontally and deliberately, or downwards. He knows that he is on a height. One can only truly esteem him who does not look out for himself. Goethe to Ratschlosser. The Chinese have a proverb that mothers even teach their children. Chao Xin, make thy heart small. This is the essentially fundamental tendency in latter-day civilizations. I have no doubt that an ancient Greek also would first of all remark the self-dwarfing in us Europeans of today. In this respect alone should we immediately be distasteful to him. What, after all, is nobleness? Words are vocal symbols for ideas. Ideas, however, are more or less definite mental symbols for frequently returning and concurring sensations, for groups of sensations. 
It is not sufficient to use the same words in order to understand one another. We must also employ the same words for the same kind of internal experiences. We must, in the end, have experiences in common. On this account, the people of one nation understand one another better than those belonging to different nations, even when they use the same language. Or, rather, when people have lived long together under similar conditions of climate, soil, danger, requirement, toil, there originate therefrom an entity that understands itself, namely, a nation. In all souls, a like number of frequently recurring experiences have gained the upper hand over those occurring more rarely. About these matters, people understand one another rapidly and always more rapidly. The history of language is the history of a process of abbreviation. On the basis of this quick comprehension, people always unite closer and closer. The greater the danger, the greater is the need of agreeing quickly and readily about what is necessary. Not to misunderstand one another in danger, that is what cannot at all be dispensed with in intercourse. Also, in all loves and friendships, one has the experience that nothing of the kind continues when the discovery has been made that in using the same words, one of the two parties has feelings, thoughts, intuitions, wishes, or fears different from those of the other. The fear of the eternal misunderstanding... That is the good genius that so often keeps persons of different sexes from too hasty attachments to which sense and heart prompt them, and not some Schopenhauerian genius of the species. Whichever groups of sensations within a soul awaken most readily, begin to speak, and give the word of command, these decide as to the general order of rank of its values, and determine ultimately its list of desirable things. A man's estimates of value betray something of the structure of his soul, and wherein it sees its conditions of life, its intrinsic needs. Supposing now that necessity has from all time drawn together only such men as could express similar requirements and similar experiences by similar symbols, it results on the whole that the easy communicability of need, which implies ultimately the undergoing only of average and common experiences, must have been the most potent of all the forces that have hitherto operated upon mankind. The more similar, the more ordinary people have always had and are still having the advantage. The more select, more refined, more unique and difficultly comprehensible are liable to stand alone. They succumb to accidents in their isolation and seldom propagate themselves. One must appeal to immense opposing forces in order to thwart this natural, all too natural, progressus in simile, the evolution of man to the similar, the ordinary, the average, the gregarious, to the ignoble. The intellectual haughtiness and loathing of every man who has suffered deeply, it almost determines the order of rank how deeply men can suffer, the chilling certainty with which he is thoroughly imbued and colored that by virtue of his suffering he knows more than the shrewdest and wisest can ever know, that he has been familiar with and at home in many distant dreadful worlds of which you know nothing, this silent intellectual haughtiness of the sufferer, this pride of the elect of knowledge, of the initiated, of the almost sacrificed, finds all forms of disguise necessary to protect itself from contact with officious and sympathizing hands, and in general from all that is not its equal in suffering. Profound suffering makes noble. It separates. One of the most refined forms of disguise is epicurism along with a certain ostentatious boldness of taste, which takes suffering lightly and puts itself on the defensive against all that is sorrowful and profound. They are gay men who make use of gaiety because they are misunderstood on account of it. They wish to be misunderstood. There are scientific minds who make use of science because it gives a gay appearance, and because scientificness leads to the conclusion that a person is superficial, they wish to mislead to a false conclusion. There are free, insolent minds which would fain conceal and deny that they are broken, proud, incurable hearts, the cynicism of Hamlet, the case of Galliani, and occasionally folly itself is the mask of an unfortunate, over-assured knowledge, from which it follows that it is the part of a more refined humanity to have reverence for the mask, and not to make use of psychology and curiosity in the wrong place. 
That which separates two men most profoundly is a different sense and grade of purity. What does it matter about all their honesty and reciprocal usefulness? What does it matter about all their mutual goodwill? The fact still remains. They cannot smell each other. The highest instinct for purity places him who is affected with it in the most extraordinary and dangerous isolation as a saint. For it is just holiness, the highest spiritualization of the instinct in question. Any kind of cognizance of an indescribable excess in the joy of the bath, any kind of ardor or thirst which perpetually impels the soul out of night into the morning and out of gloom, out of affliction into clearness, brightness, depth, and refinement, just as much as such a tendency distinguishes, it is a notable tendency, it also separates. The pity of the saint is pity for the filth of the human, all too human and there are grades and heights where pity itself is regarded by him as impurity, as filth. Signs of nobility. Never to think of lowering our duties to the rank of duties for everybody, to be unwilling to renounce or to share our responsibilities, to count our prerogatives and the exercise of them among our duties. A man who strives after great things looks upon everyone whom he encounters on his way either as a means of advance or a delay and hindrance, or a temporary resting place, or as a temporary resting place. His peculiar lofty bounty to his fellow men is only possible when he attains his elevation and dominates. In patience and the consciousness of being always condemned to comedy up to that time, for even strife is a comedy and conceals the end, as every means does, spoil all intercourse with him. This kind of man is acquainted with solitude, and what is most poisonous in it. The Problem of Those Who Wait Happy chances are necessary, and many incalculable elements, in order that a higher man in whom the solution of a problem is dormant may yet take action or break forth, as one might say, at the right moment. On an average, it does not happen and in all corners of the earth there are waiting ones sitting who hardly know to what extent they are waiting, and still less that they wait in vain. Occasionally, too, the waking call comes too late. The chance which gives permission to take action when their best youth and strength for action have been used up in sitting still, and how many a one, just as he sprang up, has found with horror that his limbs are benumbed and his spirits are now too heavy. It is too late, he has said to himself and has become self-distrustful and henceforth forever useless. In the domain of genius may not the Raphael without hands, taking the expression in its widest sense, perhaps not be the exception but the rule? Perhaps genius is by no means so rare, but rather the five hundred hands which it requires in order to tyrannize over the right time, in order to take chance by the forelock. He who does not wish to see the height of a man looks all the more sharply at what is low in him, and in the foreground, and thereby betrays himself. In all kinds of injury and loss, the lower and coarser soul is better off than the nobler soul. The dangers of the latter must be greater. The probability that it will come to grief and perish is, in fact, immense, considering the multiplicity of the conditions of its existence. In a lizard, a finger grows again which has been lost. Not so in man. It is too bad. Always the old story. When a man has finished building his house, he finds that he has learnt unawares something which he ought absolutely to have known before he began to build. The eternal fatal too late. The melancholia of everything completed. Wanderer, who art thou? I see thee follow thy path without scorn, without love, without unfathomable eyes, wet and sad as a plummet which has returned to the light, insatiated out of every depth. What did it seek down there, with a bosom that never sighs, with lips that conceal their loathing, with a head which only slowly grasps? Who art thou? What hast thou done? Rest thee here. This place has hospitality for every one. Refresh thyself. And whoever thou art, what is it that now pleases thee? What will serve to refresh thee? Only name it, whatever I have I offer thee. To refresh me? To refresh me? O oh, thou prying one, what sayest thou? But give me, I pray thee, what? What? Speak out, another mask, a second mask. Men of profound sadness betray themselves when they are happy. They have a mode of seizing upon happiness as though they would choke and strangle it out of jealousy. Ah, they know only too well that it will flee from them. 
bad, bad, what? Does he not go back? Yes, but you misunderstand him when you complain about it. He goes back like everyone who is about to make a big spring. Will people believe it of me? But I insist that they believe it of me. I have always thought very unsatisfactorily of myself and about myself, only in very rare cases, only compulsorily, always without delight in the subject, ready to digress from myself, and always without faith in the result, owing to the unconquerable distrust of the possibility of self-knowledge, which has led me so far to feel a contradictio in adjecto, even in the idea of direct knowledge which theorists allow themselves. This matter of fact is almost the most certain thing I know about myself. There must be a sort of repugnance in me to believe anything definite about myself. Is there perhaps some enigma therein? Probably. But fortunately nothing for my own teeth. Perhaps it betrays the species to which I belong, but not to myself, as it is sufficiently agreeable to me. But what has happened to you? I do not know, he said hesitatingly. Perhaps the harpies have flown over my table. It sometimes happens nowadays that a gentle, sober, retiring man becomes suddenly mad, breaks the plates, upsets the table, shrieks, raves, and shocks everybody, and finally withdraws, ashamed and raging at himself. Whither? For what purpose? To famish apart? To suffocate with his memories? To him who has the desires of a lofty and dainty soul, and only seldom finds his table laid and his food prepared, the danger will always be great. Nowadays, however, it is extraordinarily so. Thrown into the midst of a noisy and plebeian age, with which he does not like to eat out of the same dish, he may readily perish of hunger and thirst, or should he nevertheless finally fall to of sudden nausea. We have probably all sat at tables to which we did not belong, and precisely the most spiritual of us, who are most difficult to nourish, though the dangerous dyspepsia that originates from a sudden insight and disillusionment about our food and our messmates, the after-dinner nausea. If one wishes to praise at all, it is a delicate and at the same time a noble self-control to praise only where one does not agree, otherwise, in fact, one would praise oneself, which is contrary to good taste. A self-control, to be sure, which offers excellent opportunity and provocation to constant misunderstanding. To be able to allow oneself this veritable luxury of taste and morality, one must not live among intellectual imbeciles, but rather among men whose misunderstandings and mistakes amuse by their refinement, or one will have to pay dearly for it. He praises me, therefore he acknowledges me to be right. This asinine method of inference spoils half of the life of us recluses, for it brings the asses into our neighborhood and friendship. To live in a vast and proud tranquillity, always beyond. To have, or not to have, one's emotions, one's for and against, according to choice. To lower oneself to them for hours. To seat oneself on them as upon horses, and often as upon asses. For one must know how to make use of their stupidity as well as of their fire. To conserve one's three hundred foregrounds, also one's black spectacles, for there are circumstances when nobody must look into our eyes, still less into our motives, and to choose for company that roguish and cheerful vice, politeness, and to remain master of one's four virtues, courage, insight, sympathy, and solitude. For solitude is a virtue with us, as a sublime bent and bias to purity, which divines that in the contact of man and man in society it must be unavoidably impure. All society makes one somehow, somewhere, or sometime commonplace. The greatest events and thoughts, the greatest thoughts, however, are the greatest events, are longest in being comprehended. The generations which are contemporary with them do not experience such events. They live past them. Something happens there is in the realm of stars. The light of the furthest stars is longest in reaching man, and before it has arrived man denies that there are stars there. How many centuries does mind require to be understood? That is also a standard. One also makes the gradation of rank and an etiquette therewith, such as is necessary for mind and for star. Here is the prospect free, the mind exalted. Footnote Goethe's Faust, Part 2, Act 5, the words of Dr. Marianus. But there is a reverse kind of man, who is also upon a height, and has also a free prospect, but looks downwards. 
What is noble? What does the word noble still mean for us nowadays? How does the noble man betray himself? How is he recognized under this heavy overcast sky of the commencing plebeianism, by which everything is rendered opaque and leaden? It is not his actions which establish his claim. Actions are always ambiguous, always inscrutable. Neither is it his works. One finds nowadays among artists and scholars plenty of those who betray by their works that a profound longing for nobleness impels them. But this very need of nobleness is radically different from the needs of the noble soul itself, and it is, in fact, the eloquent and dangerous sign of the lack thereof. It is not the works, but the belief which is here decisive and determines the order of rank, and to employ once more an old religious formula with a new and deeper meaning, it is some fundamental certainty which a noble soul has about itself, something which is not to be sought, is not to be found, and perhaps also is not to be lost. The noble soul has reverence for itself. There are men who are unavoidably intellectual. Let them turn and twist themselves as they will, and hold their hands before their treacherous eyes, as though the hand were not a betrayer. It always comes out at last that they have something which they hide, namely, intellect. One of the subtlest means of deceiving, at least as long as possible, and of successfully representing oneself to be stupider than one really is, which in everyday life is often as desirable as an umbrella, is called enthusiasm including what belongs to it, for instance, virtue. For, as Galliani said, Vertu est enthusiasmi. In the writings of a recluse, one always hears something of the echo of the wilderness, something of the murmuring tones and timid vigilance of solitude. In his strongest words, even in his cry itself, there sounds a new and more dangerous kind of silence, of concealment. He who has sat day and night from year's end to year's end, alone with his soul in familiar discord and discourse, he who has become a cave bear or a treasure seeker or a treasure guardian and dragon in his cave, it may be a labyrinth but can also be a gold mine, his ideas themselves eventually acquire a twilight color of their own and an odor as much of the depth as of the mold, something uncommunicative and repulsive which blows chilly upon every passer-by. The recluse does not believe that a philosopher, supposing that a philosopher has always in the first place been a recluse, ever expressed his actual and ultimate opinions in books. Are not books written precisely to hide what is in us? Indeed, he will doubt whether a philosopher can have ultimate and actual opinions at all, whether behind every cave in him there is not and must necessarily be a still deeper cave an ampler, stranger, richer world beyond the surface, an abyss behind every bottom, beneath every foundation. Every philosophy is a foreground philosophy. This is a recluse's verdict. There is something arbitrary in the fact that the philosopher came to a stand here, took a retrospect, and looked around, that he here laid his spade aside and did not dig any deeper. There is also something suspicious in it. Every philosophy also conceals a philosophy. Every opinion is also a lurking place. Every word is also a mask. Every deep thinker is more afraid of being understood than of being misunderstood. The latter perhaps wounds his vanity, but the former wounds his heart, his sympathy, which always says, Ah, why would you also have as hard a time of it as I have? Man a complex, mendacious, artful, and inscrutable animal, uncanny to the other animals by his artifice and sagacity rather than by his strength, has invented the good conscience in order finally to enjoy his soul as something simple, and the whole of morality is a long, audacious falsification by virtue of which generally employment at the sight of the soul becomes impossible. From this point of view, there is perhaps much more in the conception of art than is generally believed. A philosopher, that is, a man who constantly experiences, sees, hears, suspects, hopes, and dreams extraordinary things, who is struck by his own thoughts as if they came from the outside, from above and below, as a species of events and lightning flashes peculiar to him, who is perhaps himself a storm pregnant with new lightnings, a portentous man around whom there is always rumbling and mumbling and gaping and something uncanny going on, a philosopher, alas, a being who often runs away from himself, 
is often afraid of himself, but whose curiosity always makes him come to himself again. A man who says, I like that, I take it for my own and mean to guard and protect it from everyone, a man who can conduct a case, carry out a resolution, remain true to an opinion, keep hold of a woman, punish and overthrow insolence, a man who has his indignation and his sword, and to whom the weak, the suffering, the oppressed, and even the animals willingly submit and naturally belong, in short, a man who is a master by nature when such a man has sympathy, well, that sympathy has value. But of what account is the sympathy of those who suffer, or of those even who preach sympathy? There is nowadays, throughout almost the whole of Europe, a sickly irritability and sensitiveness towards pain, and a repulsive irrestrainableness in complaining, an effeminizing, which, with the aid of religion and philosophical nonsense, seeks to deck itself out as something superior. There is a regular cult of suffering. The unmanliness of that which is called sympathy by such groups of visionaries is always, I believe, the first thing that strikes the eye. One must resolutely and radically taboo this latest form of bad taste. And finally, I wish people to put the good amulet, gay saber, gay science in ordinary language, on heart and neck as a protection against it. The Olympian Vice Despite the philosopher who as a genuine Englishman tried to bring laughter into bad repute in all thinking minds, laughing is a bad infirmity of human nature which every thinking mind will strive to overcome, Hobbes, I would even allow myself to rank philosophers according to the quality of their laughing up to those who are capable of golden laughter. And supposing that gods also philosophize, which I am strongly inclined to believe, owing to many reasons, I have no doubt that they also know how to laugh thereby in an overman-like and new fashion, and at the expense of all serious things. Gods are fond of ridicule. It seems that they cannot refrain from laughter even in holy matters. The genius of the heart as that great mysterious one possesses it, the tempter god and born rat-catcher of consciences, whose voice can descend into the netherworld of every soul, who neither speaks a word nor casts a glance in which there may not be some motive or touch of allurement, to whose perfection it pertains that he knows how to appear not as he is, but in a guise which acts as an additional constraint on his followers to press ever closer to him, to follow him more cordially and thoroughly, the genius of the heart which imposes silence and attention on everything loud and self-conceited, which smooths rough souls and makes them taste a new longing, to lie placid as a mirror that the deep heavens may be reflected in them, the genius of the heart, and to grasp more delicately, which sense the hidden and forgotten treasure, the drop of goodness and sweet spirituality under thick dark ice, and is a divining rod for every grain of gold long buried and imprisoned in mud and sand, the genius of the heart from contact with which everyone goes away richer, not favored or surprised, not as though gratified and oppressed by the good things of others, but richer in himself, newer than before, broken up, blown upon, and sounded by a thawing wind, more uncertain perhaps, more delicate, more fragile, more bruised, but full of hopes which as yet lack names, full of a new will and current, full of a new ill-will and counter-current. But what am I doing, my friends? Of whom am I talking to you? Have I forgotten myself so far that I have not even told you his name? Unless it be that you have already divined of your own accord who this questionable God and spirit is that wishes to be praised in such a manner? For as it happens to everyone who from childhood onward has always been on his legs and in foreign lands, I have also encountered on my path many strange and dangerous spirits. Above all, however, and again and again, the one whom I have just spoken, in fact no less a personage than the god Dionysus, the great equivocator and tempter, to whom, as you know, I once offered in all secrecy and reverence my first fruits, the last, as it seems to me, who has offered a sacrifice to him, for I have found no one who could understand what I was then doing. In the meantime, however, I have learned much, far too much, about the philosophy of this god, and, as I said, from mouth to mouth, I, the last disciple and initiate of the god Dionysus, and perhaps I might at last begin to give you, my friends, as far as I am allowed, a little taste of this philosophy, in a hushed voice, as is but seemly, 
for it has to do with much that is secret, new, strange, wonderful, and uncanny. The very fact that Dionysus is a philosopher, and that therefore gods also philosophize, seems to me a novelty that is not unensnaring, and might perhaps arouse suspicion precisely among philosophers. Among you, my friends, there is less to be said against it, except that it comes too late and not at the right time, for as it has been disclosed to me, you are loath nowadays to believe in God and gods. It may happen, too, that in the frankness of my story I must go further than is agreeable to the strict usages of your ears. Certainly the god in question went further, very much further, in such dialogues, and was always many paces ahead of me. Indeed, if it were allowed, I should have to give him, according to human usage, fine ceremonious tides of lustre and merit. I should have to extol his courage as investigator and discoverer, his fearless honesty, truthfulness, and love of wisdom. But such a god does not know what to do with all that respectable trumpery and pomp. Keep that, he would say, for thyself and those like thee, and whoever else require it. I have no reason to cover my nakedness. One suspects that this kind of divinity and philosopher perhaps lacks shame. He once said, Under certain circumstances I love mankind, and referred thereby to Ariadne, who was present. In my opinion, man is an agreeable, brave, inventive animal that is not his equal upon earth. He makes his way even through all labyrinths. I like man, and often think how I can still further advance him and make him stronger, more evil, and more profound. "'Stronger, more evil, and more profound?' I asked in horror. "'Yes,' he said again. "'Stronger, more evil, and more profound. "'Also more beautiful.' "'And thereby the tempter god smiled with his halcyon smile "'as though he had just paid some charming compliment. "'One here sees at once that it is not only shame that this divinity lacks, "'and in general there are good grounds for supposing "'that in some things the gods could all of them come to us men for instruction.' We men are more human. Alas, what are you, after all, my written and painted thoughts? Not long ago you were so variegated, young and malicious, so full of thorns and secret spices, that you made me sneeze and laugh. And now you have already doffed your novelty, and some of you, I fear, are ready to become truths. So immortal do they look, so pathetically honest, so tedious. And was it ever otherwise? What then do we write and paint, we mandarins with Chinese brush, we immortalizers of things which lend themselves to writing? What are we alone capable of painting? Alas, only that which is just about to fade and begins to lose its odor. Alas, only exhausted and departing storms and belated yellow sentiments. Alas, only birds strayed and fatigued by flight, which now let themselves be captured with the hand, with our hand. We immortalize what cannot live and fly much longer, things only which are exhausted and mellow. And it is only for your afternoon, you, my written and painted thoughts, for which alone I have colors, many colors, perhaps many variegated softenings, and fifty yellows and browns and greens and reds, but nobody will divine thereby how ye looked in your morning. You sudden sparks and marvels of my solitude, you, my old beloved evil thoughts. From the Heights by F. V. Nietzsche, translated by L. A. Manius. Midday of life, O oh season of delight, my summer's park, unceaseful joy to look, to lurk, to hark, I peer for friends, am ready day and night. Where linger ye, my friends? The time is right. Is not the glaciers gray to-day for you rose-garlanded? The brooklet seeks you, wind, cloud, with longing thread, and thrust themselves yet higher to the blue, to spy for you from farthest eagle's view. My table was spread out for you on high. Who dwelleth so star near, so near the grisly pit below? My realm, what realm hath wider boundary? My honey, who hath sipped its fragrancy? Friends, ye are there. Woe me, yet I am not he whom ye seek. Ye stare and stop, better your wrath could speak. I am not I, hand, gate, face, changed, and what I am to you, my friends, now am I not? 
Am I an other? Strange am I to me? Yet from me sprung? A wrestler by himself too oft self-wrung, Hindering too oft my own self's potency, Wounded and hampered by self-victory, I sought whereso the winds blow keenest. There I learned to dwell where no man dwells, On lonesome ice-lorn fell, And unlearned man and God and curse and prayer Became a ghost haunting the glaciers bare. Yes, my old friends, look, Ye turn pale, filled o'er with love and fear. Go, yet not in wrath, ye could ne'er live here. Here in the farthest realm of ice and scar, A huntsman must one be, like Shamisor. An evil huntsman was I. See how taut my bow was bent. Strongest was he by whom such bolt were sent. Woe now! That arrow is with peril fraught. Perilous is none. Have yon safe home ye sought? Ye go, thou didst endure enough, O heart. Strong was thy hope. Unto new friends thy portals widely ope. Let old ones be. Bid memory depart. Wast thou young then? Now better young thou art. What linked us once together one hope's tie? Who now doth con those lines, now fading, love once wrote thereon, is like a parchment which the hand is shy to touch, like crackling leaves, all seared, all dry. Oh, friends no more! They are, what name for those? Friends phantom flight knocking at my heart's window pane at night, gazing on me, that speaks we were, and goes, oh, withered words, once fragrant as the rose, pinings of youth that might not understand for which I pined, which I deemed changed with me, kin of my kind. But they grew old, and thus were doomed and banned. None but new kith are native of my land. Midday of life, my second youth's delight, my summer's park, unrestful joy to long, to lurk, to hark. I peer for friends, am ready day and night for my new friends. Come, come, the time is right. This song is done, the sweet sad cry of rue sang out its end. A wizard wrought it, he the timely friend, the midday friend. No, do not ask me who. At midday twas when one became as two. We keep our feast of feasts, sure of our born, our aims self-same. The guest of guests, friend Zarathustra, came. The world now laughs, the grisly veil was torn, and light and dark were one that wedding morn. End of Frederick Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil Recorded by LibriVox user Presleth, P-R-E-S-L-E-T-H-E -E, Montgomery, Alabama, United States, July 2006